Thank you. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tanui, for the kind introduction. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I'm very happy to be here in person uh, to participate in this year's international workshop on HIV and pediatrics. And my role in this session is really to give an overview of the potential new directions in infant postnatal antiretroviral prophylaxis and treatment. I have nothing to disclose. So, uh, one slide on statistics. I know we've seen a lot of over the last few few days, and I've I had to you know after the meal last night update the first bullet. I hope I got it right. But I think with the new stats, we have about 1.3 million women who uh, with HIV become pregnant, and the amount uh, who receive ERT is a little bit down compared to previous. I think I think it's now down at 81 percent. And what these women receive uh, is now we know is triple uh, ERT, or uh, likely most of the women receiving TLD starting early as possible during pregnancy, or if they're already on treatment, could continue throughout pregnancy delivery and breastfeeding with you know, viral load monitoring as much as possible, depending on this, on this uh, country, and then along with the infant uh, prophylaxis of nevirapine plus or minus ESRT. And if we know this, if we do this, and I'm going to start with a very positive, we can prevent the transmission. We can get less than 1%, but obviously that's not the case in the world because there's many challenges, and those challenges are shortfalls in testing, treatment coverage, adherence, retention in care, and of course making this 1% rate can be done in some settings, but obviously it needs new interventions to try to get it to as low as possible in, in other settings. And I apologize, I haven't updated this slide, but this is the general picture, and you've seen these stack bars quite a few times, and what we saw last year at least that we see around of the you know, 1.2 million, there's around you know, 100,000 children who are infected. So it's, it's actually a global transmission rate of about 10%. And these are occurring where they were in 50% breastfeeding, 50% uh, uh, during pregnancy. Although yesterday, I think, again, that it slightly changed. But a bit, I think I looked, it was a bit lower during the pregnancy compared, not exactly 50-50. But in general, and the reasons for these infections are really mothers who receive no ART, or they have dropped off ART, uh, those during pregnancy, and mothers who are infected during breastfeeding. This is a big uh, new population that we need to focus on, and mothers who drop out ART during breastfeeding. Here's the, the, the current guidelines. Again, I, don't, I think everybody know, knows them, but uh, we have the, the stratified by risk for the WHO, not high risk, high risk, with uh, not high risk, you know, dependent on breastfeeding or not breastfeeding. And, you know, single drug, uh, it's a known of European for six weeks, while high risks get dual drugs for either six weeks or 12 weeks, depending if they're breastfeeding or not. And the definition of high risk is uh, shown in the box, which is related to the duration of treatment and or, you know, availability of viral load. But this presentation is about, you know, looking forward, and we need to use all the brains in this room to try to think what we can do to, to try to see what we do. We've had in the past, you know, AZD single-dose nevirapine. It worked very well. We have the risk stratified uh, AZD nevirapine now, but let's dream big and give us the ideas at the end of the presentation to see if we can come up with something new. But I have to put this slide in at a minute, otherwise people would say, well, why are you st still talking about infant prophylaxis? We know how to prevent shit. So the optimal infant prophylaxis, some people will say, maybe Elaine at the front for sure, is that we don't give anything. We don't need to give it. The baby say, leave me alone. I don't want any of your drugs. So, but that's only in the era of maternal potent ART. So if we can do that, if we can ensure that they have good treatment, constant adherence, therefore we could argue that you don't need to give it. If they're undetectable throughout the, the whole of pregnancy at, at, uh, until delivery, do you need to, to do it? And that is you know, a discussion to be had. Whether we are there yet, of course, with TLD, it's potent, but of course we had adherence, but with long-acting ARV, so the context of postnatal prophylaxis, infant postnatal prophylaxis, in the event of you know, long-acting, maternal long-acting, is an interesting question, but we have to put this on the table. So what are the choice of ARVs if we have to talk about infant prophylaxis? We've been stuck, or it's a little bit of a negative one. I was just trying to say that he was, we've been hitting a wall, not necessarily headbutting a wall, but <laughs> we can... Uh, AZT and nevirapine have been the, the stalwart of what we have been using. And I am a strong supporter in nevirapine AZT. They've been very good. They have prevented thousands of transmissions, but they're still daily oral syrups or twice daily oral syrups. And you can count probably on one hand how many adults in the world are taking nevirapine uh, or you know, AZT to some extent. So the, you know, the global market for these drugs, even in the pediatric population, is probably going down. So can we continue to you know, get these drugs available for postnatal prophylaxis? But don't worry, we have a lot of choices. Don't be scared, there's no problem. But as you know, when you start to do research in HIV, prof uh, uh, HIV pediatric HIV, you get, a, you get a magic wand. You all have one, by the way. And I've got mine here. And it does work to make things disappear. I could make Tanui disappear, but I don't want to. 
But what I can do, you can wave it very hard, and then you can see what antiretrovirals are actually available. And for neonates, it's not a lot. And so put your ones away, by the way. You don't want to see it. So we have very limited antiretrovirals for neonates uh, and infants to some extent. We have the classic AZT and Aviropine, but there's some data now on Abacavir. Uh, we have some solid data formulation on Voltagravir and Maraviroc, but again, not really you know, used widely at this point. So what can we do? So we need to have some way to push over this imaginary wall. I want to highlight that we do have 3DC in Lapinavir. That was used in the ANRS PROMISE study, where they used, from one week of age, the liquid 3TC and lipinavir, which worked very well to prevent transmission. So I just put that on the top of the wall. But let's see if we can go more, and what are the options that we can use? Well, I mentioned nothing, but there are other options that we can have the pediatric fixed, fixed dose combinations, the new ones. We have the lipinavir granules, uh, DTG dispersible, the uh, abacavir 3TC dispersible, and the more exciting ones that you know, we want to think about more is the BNABs, intramuscular carbotegavir, and then capovir. So during this presentation, I'm going to try to give some information about what we can do for each one. And of course, because I'm a pharmacologist, I have to have one slide on pharmacology, and I've tried to keep it out as much as possible. But I, this is an important point that I think we need to highlight. And that is that when we think about giving drugs to the infants and the units, it's very complicated in terms of the pharmacology. Uh, but when we think of going down from adult, adolescent, child, we can use allometric scaling, milligram per kilogram, because we know that you have to give a higher dose compared to that uh, in adults. So we have that mentality, we need to give a higher dose to children compared to adults. But then when you get to the neonate, it flips, because they have the maturation issue, so you have to give a lower dose, milligram per kilogram dose. So that's sometimes that, uh, conf not confusion, but we have to think about that, and that's why I sometimes like to put this black box at the very young age. It's like a, it's not a chocolate box, it's a maturation box and it looks at liver and kidney function. It's very difficult to predict. So depending on the drug you give, like 3TC, which is eliminated by the kidney, or dolutegravir C, limited by enzymes, you can see the ability to know how that drug is eliminated or removed is quite difficult to predict. So I don't want to talk about enzymes too much, but we have the cytochrome enzymes and the phase two UGT enzymes, which metabolize the drugs we commonly use for, anti uh, for HIV. And these can change very quickly during the first few weeks of life. If you look at the one on the right, you can see the very steep curve, the activity of these enzymes switch on very quickly in the baby. We saw for your back of year that can change within fivefold within two weeks. So it can be very difficult to, to, to what you're gonna give. And we see for Waltegavir, you have to shift the, drug, the, uh, the, the dose quite quickly. Firstly, let's not forget the preterm babies. I'm not gonna to talk too much about preterm babies, but we have to mention them. And there was a lovely, lovely isn't probably the wrong word, an interesting uh, case, case discussion yesterday about that. And that shows that because we know that the risk of preterm delivery is higher in the context of HIV. We have preterm infants have even more complicated PK. The, the way that the enzymes change re, changes even more. And there, we know that there's research gap. The case yesterday gave us is a T3TC in the Viropine to a, a, a baby that was born prematurely at gestational age 30 weeks, and they did a great job. And they did exactly what they followed in guidelines. But those guidelines, it's not a huge amount of data that supports them. So we're trying with the help of IMPACT and WHO to do some modeling work, again, on the older drugs, but it's what we have, 3TC in the Viropine uh, for less than 34 weeks. And hopefully we'll have some more data to be more reassuring what to give to those children who are born, let's say, less than 34 weeks, maybe down to 28 weeks. Okay, let's move forward. Uh, but before I just quickly look at the other drugs, we have to be careful about how we position each of the drugs that we're gonna talk about. So you, we always think about AIV prophylaxis, we think about single drugs, dual drugs, mm -hmm. and now in more high income settings, perhaps we're thinking about presumptive treatment with three drugs, start them very early, in early infant treatment, and then antiretroviral treatment. So when we talk about which of the drugs, where does that drug fit in in this? Can it be used for prophylaxis? Can it be continued to be used for uh, treatment or then, and then afterwards? So when we're talking about it, the, the next few slides, the individual drug, we have to think where it would fit in here. Is it part of a presumptive treatment? Okay, you confirm an infection, you continue. Or it could be a prophylaxis and you add on treatment. On service. It's, not, it's not complicated, but obviously the dream, let's say, if you think big, can we have something that could cover all? So if you cover the majority of women for prophylaxis, uh, children, sorry, infants with prophylaxis, and then maybe if they are infected, you can continue. And one of the uh, studies that I've been involved in recently, with, and this is with Adri Becker at the University of Stellenbosch in, in, in Chiang Mai University where I am. This is funded by UNITED, and this is a series of studies we call the petite studies now, and this was trying to use fixed dose combinations that are already available for children, infants, to be used in neonates. So the first study we did, we looked at what we called the petite four-in-one study. So the four-in-one study is 
this new formulation that was produced by Cipler and DNDI, you probably heard about it, where it was a Bacavir 3D sealer Pinavirotonavir. It was designed for, for children, infants. But we said, can we also give it to neonates? The doses are not perfect, so it's not ideal. And you'll see the result in a minute, and it's not ideal. Uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, if we move forward after that, so we have to then think about you know, splitting it up. So we're doing all cont continuing with the Petita Bacavir 3 tc Lepinavirotonavir, which is using the, a quarter of the generic tablet of the uh, 12060 in neonates from birth and two sachets of the Lepinavirotonavir. And looking forward, there is some discussion about doing to complement the, uh, the work being done by Impact is that the Petit DTG study uh, we, we're waiting for some uh, funding information from UNITED, but that would be hopefully that could be done also. But again, I'll go into that. It's not, it's not a simple thing to do. So the first study we did for Petit was looking at the 4-in-1 in neonates. This was a, a phase one open label study uh, of 50 HIV exposed neonates, and it was done in Cape Town at Tigerberg Hospital with Adri. We looked at single doses to start with in neonates, and the Abacavir 3TC looked really good. It was higher as we expected because you know, it was a high dose, milligram per kilogram, but that obviously you can't change it because it's fixed dose. But it was safe. But then you, when you looked at the lapinavir in this, it was very low. So it's a bit disappointing to say the least. So, but I think we have to say that we have some good safety and uh, data on a back of year 3TC. So this is the first time the solid fixed dose combination of a back of year 3TC had been given to neonates and it was safe. Uh, but the lipinavir levels were low. And this is the challenges of fixed dose combinations. How do you, you cannot always get what you want. So we cannot increase too much more lipinavir because the abacavir would be too high. So with the study team and of course with the DSMB, we agreed to stop this study. And uh, we switched to what we call the petite abacavir where we could separate. And this is all supported by now uh, Mylan and Vitaris for providing the, the lipinavir granules and uh, the abacavir 3TC. So that's very supportive. And we're doing multi-doses now, and this study is ongoing, where we're giving multi-doses of this quarter tab from birth, plus two sachets of the lipinavirotonavir for 28 days. And we had a DSMB recent, recently, and they said you can continue with the multi-dose, and actually, it just fully enrolled last week, so we have 16 babies who have received this combination of quarter tab plus two sachets for uh, a month, for the first month of life. So we hopefully get those results soon. But sometimes I talk about lipinavir and people start shooting me. Why are we talking about lipinavir? <laughs> Should we be talking about DTG? So let's talk about DTG. Let's look forward. So it's, it's not easy as well. So giving DTG is not easy. So as I said, it's metabolized by the UGT1 enzyme. You'll hear that a lot. So the maturation is quite difficult. So if you give five milligrams DTG to a neonate, as we saw, it's going to be very high in the first one day, two day, three days of life, mm -hmm. and then it's going to come down. But mm -hmm. how high is too high? And it's pretty high, actually. So actually, in reality, it's not convenient. But if you wanted to give the 5 milligram DTG dispersible tablet to a neonate, even in the context if the mother got DTG or not, because it does cross the placenta, you may have to give it every, every other day, or every three days. We don't know. So this is the kind of complexity. So it might be said, yes, let's give it, let's give it. But it may not be as easy as we would like, especially if you're using the fixed dose combination. But with uh, the help, you know, the, the, the IMPACT 2023 study, which is looking actually the liquid first to try to get more optimal dosing before we move with the, with the five milligram, but hopefully we can complement if we get funding for the petite DTG to try to complement each other to get this data quickly. Okay, what about long acting? Well, we know that CAB now is very effective for prevention. In adults, we have the HPTN 083 and 084 studies which have been shown that they could, versus TDF and TAF, that it can prevent transmission. And as Martina said yesterday, we have the PADO5 priority list, and CAB was added in there for, specifically for prophylaxis as a priority product. Now, putting it as a priority product, is, it sounds hard, and it's not easy, Martina, to get it in there. But now once it's in there, you have to try to get it into reality as well. So let's try to make it a reality. We have to think, what is the challenges to get CAB into neonates? It's not a simple thing as well. CAB is metabolized by UGT1, this damn UGT1, it's a nightmare. But if you do it, it's very difficult. So you will have the maturation problem as well. And there has been some modeling work done already with the LEAP people. This is with Professor Andrew Owen at the University of Liverpool, where they try to model what happens if you give CAB to a neonate. I'm not going to go into the modeling, but what this modeling highlighted, which is quite interesting and we don't think about so much, is that if you give it and you release it in the thigh, it might take a little bit of time to get to therapeutic levels. So one of the reasons we chose nevirapine in the first place, because you give it, it, it's absorbed fast and it, you can put, get protective levels very quickly. But for CAB, are we sure that when you inject it, let's say into the thigh of a neonate, it can be 
released quick enough to get high enough levels. So you may have to cover something with the, a few days. Again, there's a lot of discussion about this, whether that's needed or not, I don't know. But this is what it's, 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 it was uh, officially shown, so we have to see. But then we talk about the muscle, and this is not a, just a picture of a, a glutinous for you to, to show you, but what, what, what we see in adolescents, and we've seen this in our site in Thailand, who are doing the adolescent study for impact, it's, it's, it's very well received, actually, the, uh, the intramuscular injections, at least in adolescents. But if we're going to do it in neonates, we're going to have to do it in the thigh. So how different is that muscle to the thigh? And I was talking about this with Sharon Nockman yesterday. They, they are quite different. So, but neonatologists, when you talk to them, they're not worried about intramuscular injections, actually. I think maybe the others are, but they don't seem to be too injecting. They do it a lot. And the volume you would use, let's say we took that intramuscular dose that they got from the slide before, 20 milligrams, they said. You can give 0.2 mils of the current formulation, and it's still below 0.5, so you could do it in theory. But that's the idea. What about the needle size? You need to think about the length. You need to think about the size and, and the muscle that it's coming out of. And uh, I found this on the internet. So and maybe Aviv colleagues can comment, but they are looking at now, in adults at least, giving it into the thigh, and maybe we could learn from that study how it releases from an adult thigh is not the same as a neonate thigh, I'm aware of that, <laughs> but at least it might be different from the, the gluteus muscle. So again, we need to think about all these things. It's not easy, so getting that first injection into a neonate has to have a lot of thought. What about subcutaneous injections? That's a possibility. They, they have done studies on that, but it seems to have been not talked about as much, but let's talk about it. Maybe it's not possible, but we could think about it. But of course, we need safety data in CAB, Ropivirine, in pregnant women and children. There's many studies going on. Uh, we have the MOCA, the CREON, the LATA, and now the CREATE study. A good name, the CREATE study, by the way. And this is uh, looking at pregnancy and postpartum CAB, Ropivirine, and we'll sh probably get some washout data as well. But let's think about it. In we all know probably agree, I hope, that there's a large potential for long-acting CAB for postnatal prophylaxis if we can come over these challenges. We have the pharmacology, safety, clinical development, and supply chain. Although I just saw a, a message on my phone saying that Viva announced that they are, have a gene generic partner for cabotegraphy. I might be wrong, but you can <laughs> comment at the end. I just saw it about two minutes before the presentation. So that's excellent news. So if you can get CAB generic, don't know how much it costs, et cetera, et cetera, it may, again, facilitate the use of this potential uh, important regimen for this, these vulnerable women. But I, I put on the slide there, we can overcome it. Not me, all of you here. Right? It's not me by myself, but we've come over much more harder things, but we can easily do that. So last one for long acting is then Capovir. I'm not going to talk about it much, but we just need to highlight it. It's an important drug, especially in adults. It's going to be used for treatment and prevention. It's subcutaneous. It is, again, metabolized by our nemesis, the UGT1A1, and it's going to have some problems the same as them. We're going to have to think about how to give that dosing. Do we need some cover? But the purpose one and two trials in adults, again, like the HPTN0A384, uh, and 84, will give us lots of information to see if we think that this is a drug that could also be applicable to uh, that po the population of you know, young infants. So lastly, I think I talk about passive immunization. And we had a nice talk on the cost effectiveness today, but we see that for passive immunization, we have the AMP studies, which I'm sure most of you know, where it showed that two placebo randomized control trial, unfortunately, for VCR1, did not prevent HIV ac acquisition more effectively than placebo. VCR1 was, but however, when you looked at the, you know, the sensitivity of the virus, when it was sensitive against that antibody, it worked very well. And I think we've all agreed for a long time that giving a combination of antibodies, uh, two or three or four in combination with maybe antiretrovirals as well, is probably where this is going to fit in. Uh, but uh, we'll have to see. But there's, there's a, some good studies going on. We saw that Toledo study in Botswana for treatment, very effective. There was, a, I think, a study in adults just published in Nature recently where they interrupted with two antibodies for seven days or 24 weeks, and all seven of them remained undetectable after 24 weeks. So that was very impressive. But what I like about the antibodies and the scientific community in this sense is that we've waited for a long time to get CAB or uh, dolutegravir, abacavir into neonates. But here, for antibodies, we are ahead of the game. We have much more. We have already done neonatal studies for uh, these studies. So through the Impact Network, they are uh, you know, leading the way in getting the 11-12 uh, study using the VCR1 and then an improved version, the VCR1 uh, LS, showing it's safe showing that it can be given uh, every three months. So it's all pharmacokinetics at this point, but it has to be done. And this has not been waiting 10 years later. They're doing it now. And hopefully, 
Who could, who could dream that you could get it approved in children before you get it approved in adults? Let's see. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is the design. You have these, I can, it's easy for me to talk about different drugs, we want to study it, et cetera, et cetera, but how are you going to do it? Are you going to get the NIH to give you a lot of money to do a phase three study? I doubt it. So you need to think about more effective ways to test these interventions in settings where you have very low transmission rates. And we, through the experience of COVID, we have a lot of platform studies for COVID. Uh, for pediatric TB, for MDR-TB, they're thinking about doing a lot of platform studies so to try to, as new TB drugs come in, they can quickly assess them in children. And should we think about something here for adaptive designs for uh, antiretroviral prophylaxis? So we can think about Bayesian design. This is the, the last PMTTC study we did in Thailand, the PHPD-5 study. We used the Bayesian design because it was impossible to do a, a, a controlled study, and it worked very well. I'm not a statistician, but it seems that we can think of ways, more clever people than me, to try to do things that we can do the study quickly and efficiently and cost-effectively so we get the results fast. Okay, I have three minutes left, so I'm a bit early, but uh, I'm gonna end on a little bit of a light note. I didn't know whether to put this in or not, and Elaine asked me when she said, who the hell is Michael? <laughs> so Michael is somebody that I was watching the internet with my son the other day, and I thought, this is an interesting story. This is somebody called Michael Superbacker. He invested in a Kickstarter company to make a, an umbrella for air, so it was an air umbrella. So you put it up, it blows air, there's no top, and it protects you from the rain. And I thought, that's oh. it. And he liked this idea, Michael, I don't know who he is. And he thought, I'm going to invest money in this air umbrella. I want an air umbrella. So he put his money in, and then they never replied to him. I said, why? <laughs> but Michael is dedicated. So he emailed this company every week for seven years, <laughs> asking where his umbrella is. Some of them are not so polite. But I put a few here. Merry Christmas, everyone. Where's my umbrella? <laughs> Day two, four, three, where's my umbrella? It's still raining, where's my umbrella? So I think what I'm trying to say, is not just to go on, on, on a joke, but there is a serious note. We have many Michael Superbackers already in the room who have been pushing constantly, not about umbrellas, but about PM, PM, uh, postnatal prophylaxis. And I think if we can continue, like Michael, who's inspiring me, to, to be consistent and to try to get treatment for children. So forget the Michael, but it's just an analogy to try to say, we can do it, we can push more, and we can do better. So. My last point, I have clearly there's still residual infant HIV transmissions and breastfeeding, the, the, the women who become infected during breastfeeding, so we need to plug the leaks. How do we do that? We can cut critical to contain, uh, continue generic PK and safety data in units through the, and the petite studies looking at solid formulations who are not meant for neonates but also meant for, uh, could be tried to see if we can use in, in uh, neonates, didn't always work, but we can continue to try to uh, explore these avenues. And lastly, could long-acting carb, BNABs, lencapavir, et cetera, be a game changer? And if they are a game changer, how do we get them to study them? And that's, and that's where I'll stop. I'll just say thank you for the uh, Adri Martino Lane who uh, discussed the presentation with me. And of course, all of the colleagues who joined in the workshop on uh, WTO Impact that was held last year, uh, who have you know, contributed to this overall discussion. And several, I just put as a reference, uh, some new publications that have just come out about the PADO-5 and uh, neonatal ARVs and uh, other approaches that are coming out. So if you need more information, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for excellent talk, Tim. Any comments or questions or idea? David, please. Thank you, uh, Tim. Uh, David Berger here in Nijmegen, Netherlands. It was excellent and very inspiring. Um, you know, we have some experience with uh, doyotecophia in, well, not really the babies, but the young children. And you have seen the data, too, that there's such a large variability. We, we've seen trough levels of doyotecophia of almost zero and up to four or something like that. And that will even be larger, likely, if you go into the neonates. So, are you seeing a concern on that? Or, um, and, and another question, of course, how can we explain that huge variability? So two questions. Well, I think, I think it's, a, it's a huge variability and a huge problem. So I think that we have to think that, and also an, when you have huge variability, you want to have more subjects to do it, to, to, to predict the variability. But in the studies we're going to do in neonates, you're only going to have eight babies, 10 babies. So, the f so you, 
then it becomes the balance of how much can we, how many babies could we do to try to account for that variability? And this is where the modeling probably comes in. Modeling has, of course, huge assumptions that sometimes can, you know, be misleading, but it's, it's striking that balance between having enough babies to get the data and, uh, you know, try to predict that uncertainty. And as you know, for PK, we'll do the PK study in eight or 10 babies or 15 babies, but then we're gonna have to do larger studies of safety where that variability, hopefully from the PK, is not lead to any clinical impact. So, but if you have any ideas, David, as well, <laughs> let me know. And Gemma? Yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for the humor, Tim. <laughs> not the science, just the humor, I know. <laughs> okay. And the science, too. Okay. <laughs> but my question was with respect to the supply pipeline of lopinavir, ritonavir granules, mm -hmm. because with most of our countries now transitioning to pediatric DTG, we are finding supply chain issues with the lopinavir granules, lopinavir retonavir granules. So if you were doing your petit four, you might actually not have supply. Well, there was, it, it, it's a good point. I, I mean, I was involved with uh, the development of the 4 one from the beginning with Mark Lalmont, who was my ex-boss in Thailand, and he went to work for DNDI. So he's been, he was developing it, and it's unfortunately, it's taken so long to get to this point. It's taken, I mean, I don't know if people from DNDI are listening, but it took longer than they thought as well. And now it's come to a point where it's probably gonna be available, as you said, what is the incentive for the national programs to buy it when they can now buy DTG? So it's a little bit unfortunate. I think there's a lot of frustration from them at that point. And it was not, I mean, uh, at least in the discussions I was involved, it was not their fault. It, it, there was, you know, because of COVID, the US FDA had to go to check the plant in India, and there was some discussion that it was taking much longer than they thought. So for, this, for the petite DTG study, we were supplied by CIPLA directly. So, but again, it's not easy to get because they don't make a lot at that point, and they were having this issue with the manufacturing. So I don't know where it's going to fit in. It's up to the country level, like yourself, to, to see where are they going to buy it or are they going to have it as a backup for, you know, if DTG is not available, but it's not probably going to have as high impact as which was first thought, and, and that's unfortunate. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Alistair from the UK. I haven't spoken to you for a while about, about this, and I, I, I feel really invigorated to try and work on it again, but I think one of the things that I'd love to see is harmonization of approach across the world, like we now have with the treatment guidelines, for example. Um, I'm about to do the survey for Penta where we're going to look at each European country, and I'm pretty sure every European country is doing something slightly different with their postnatal prophylaxis. And I think the recent survey of um, high prevalence countries has also shown that everyone's doing something slightly different. The US guidelines are different to the UK guidelines. So how are we going to achieve that harmonization across all areas in the absence of much data to inform practice. Well, thank you for the PK question. Uh, I, 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 but I, I think, but in my opinion, it's a trough level. No, uh, it's a, no, I think it's a good question. I think in Europe, uh, that you have so many different guidelines. And from a Europe standpoint, they're going to have to find a way to bring them together. On the, Nash, on the global level, I think even though Thailand has its own guidelines, they're very similar to the WHO in some respects. So maybe outside the, you know, the European uh, setting, and you can, you can advise more. Is there a way to, you know, to try to follow that? I think, again, Kenya, Uganda, South Africa have their own guidelines, but again, there's probably, and please comment if, if I'm wrong, but they are quite similar to the WHO guidelines. So I think harmonization in the, the global PMTCD might be easier than even in, the, in Europe, but with the PENTA, maybe you can try to find a way to, to bring them together and to try to see, we need to get you know, which drug we want to harmonize first, but then we can find a way, find a way to do it. I think, Martina, you want to help Tim? <laughs> the baby show? <laughs> no, actually, I wanted to ask him a PK question. Okay. To help him. <laughs> <laughs> no, th Tim, that was a great talk. Um, just um, was wondering whether there is any drug used in neonates that is intramuscular or subcutaneous that could inspire or could help us to try to anticipate how some of these long-acting compounds could actually be utilized and, and the challenges of addressing and anticipating that uncertainty that you were talking about. Is there any drug that 
we could study a little bit more to try to, to learn something. Yeah, well, for the hepatitis B, we have the immunoglobulins, immunoglobulins and we have the, but again, I think in, in terms of the, you know, long acting, uh, I can't think of any, I mean, we have the vitamin, vitamin K, we have the antibiotic, uh, as you know, the immunoglobulins. We'll have to look in other fields, and I'm not as aware as I should, perhaps, that the other ones, if someone has an, an example, let me know. And you can, please, which, which one, sorry, Natalia? Antibiotics. Yeah, antibiotics. So we'll have to look at that and see if we can glean from that what we can do to see if we can apply it, because obviously for the cab, as I said, there's many, many unanswered questions, and uh, the modeling is going to be a big part, but there's only so far modeling can go. So having experience from other drugs, we need to have that to give us confidence so that when that first injection is given, we are... We are all feel comfortable. Vanessa? Um, great talk, thank you. Uh, about your point about harmonization, I think it's wonderful. Um, I think it's important to remember that there are different prevalence countries, um, and uh, WHO guidelines tend to dictate the funding that those different countries get. So back to the point about lopinavir not being available anymore because dolutegravir has been proposed. Uh, WHO, when they um, said that CD4 monitoring was no longer required, PEPFAR support just stopped, so you can't do CD4 monitoring. So I think, uh, and different countries have different budgets and capacity to support these things. So I think it's important that when we're thinking about postnatal prophylaxis and really reaching EMTCT, it's important that what we recommend we work in coordination with our funding supporters that it'll be something that will be uh, available to all countries. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. So please join me for a big applaud for Tim for his excellent talk.